So in the next uh, 10 to 12 minutes, I will talk on two important drugs which are creating a sensational wave in the treatment of diabetes worldwide. But before that, I realized that this audience is a combination of both medical and some non-medical people. So excuse me if I go to some basics, at the same time, go to a little advanced level. And uh, because it is to justify the, both the audience. So in the next 10, 12 minutes, let's see uh, what we have, the two drugs which we have with us. So, So my talk is going to be on a new drug, but before I go to this new drug, I'm going to talk for about two, three minutes on a little older drug, but which is creating equally an equal sensation in the management treatment of diabetes. So my talk is going to be on a peptide in a pill, which is a new drug, which is just being introduced uh, in India. It's been abroad, already launched in the United States. I dedicated this talk, dedicated this talk to my father who taught me the basics of diabetes and who made me a diabetologist. Uh, he said, it was his own words, that every person having diabetes should be helped to live his normal span of life in perfect health. This was what he said. We have not cooked it up. He said this in an interview that every person having diabetes should be helped to live his normal span of life in perfect health. So because why he said that was because many people think that when they get diabetes, they are going to die in the next few years. They cannot have a normal span. But Professor M. Vishwanathan firmly believed that anybody having diabetes can be helped, can live his normal span of life like any other pe person. And that too in perfect health without this kidney and eye getting damaged and so on. Now, if somebody, why, why should we bother about high blood sugar? So if somebody asks me how to define diabetes, I would define it as Diabetes is a vascular disease. Now, why it's vascular disease? It's a blood vessel disease. Because it affects every single blood vessel you can think of in the body. High blood sugar leads to changes in the blood vessels. It can be in the brain, heart, in the nerves, in the foot, inside the kidney, or inside the retina of the eye, inside the eye. So because of all these complications, diabetes is referred to or is defined today as a vascular disease. So that's the basic definition which I would give. Of course, people would say it's a deficiency of insulin. Insulin is not working properly. All that is there. But if you ask me to define diabetes, I would say it's a vascular disease. Now, why are Indians getting so much of diabetes? It is estimated that there are some 80 million people with diabetes in India. Now, we should understand that there is something called an Indian phenotype. Phenotype means what is special to diabetes. What is to, special to Indians, I mean. So the diabetes which occurs in people with, people with in, in, in India is called the Indian phenotype. And this is typically called as a thin fat Indians. So the Indians have compared to the Europeans and the Caucasian population, the white population, we have lesser muscle mass, which is called sarcopenia. And they have more fat mass. They have fatty liver. They have more fat within the intestines, visceral fat everywhere, the subcutaneous fat, the tummy and so on. Now, 
we have a new machine which was gifted to us from the University of Michigan, which can measure the muscle mass and also the fat mass. We are using it for research purpose mainly because it was gifted to us by the University of Michigan for a research project. Now, because Indians have more fat and less muscle, we have what is called more insulin resistance and there are higher CRP levels. And Indians have a typical abdominal obesity, the subcutaneous fat which accumulates around the na navel region. If you were to measure some cytokines, as we call it, you have lower levels of adiponectin. Now, adiponectin can be increased by exercising, yoga, and so on. Now, if you measure the cholesterol levels, of course, we do have in diabetes a high level of LDL, but more commonly, we have high triglyceride levels in Indians and a low HDL. You take your cholesterol levels in many people with diabetes in India, you will find the triglycerides are very high and the HDL is very low. This is characteristic of the people in India, even without diabetes. People who do not have diabetes also have very low HDL levels and high triglyceride levels. And of course, this sort of Asian Indian phenotype predisposes you to type 2 diabetes and heart disease. Now, this is a very important slide, and this is the basis of my entire talk. Now, when we say diabetes, the type 2 diabetes is more common. There is a diabetes which occurs because insulin is not working properly, as you saw in the previous slide. All of us know the story of the three musketeers. The three musketeers was written by a French novelist, Alexandre Dumas, Dumas in 1899. So diabetes is not a single entity. It is accompanied by two other musketeers, the cardiovascular disease and the kidney disease. So diabetes is only one part of this whole syndrome, as we call it. Along with diabetes, you get a high prevalence of cardiovascular disease, which is hypertension, coronary artery disease, heart failure, and so on. And then you have a high preponderance of chronic kidney disease. Now, along with type 2 diabetes, we also have this classical cholesterol pattern, which I talked to you in the previous slide. You have fatty liver and you have obesity, especially in the abdomen area. Now, I'm going to go to the first drug. This is a drug which has been in the market, which has been in use for about three or four years. And every day the data is coming out in favor of this drug. It's called an SGLT2 inhibitor. SGLT2 inhibitor. It's very much available in India for the past three, four years. And we had earlier, or we still have earlier, and we still have a drug called canaglyphlosin, and then came dapaglyphlosin, empaglyphlosin, and an Indian variety called remoglyphlosin. So these are called SGLT2 inhibitors. And as I told you, they act on all the three musketeers. They act on the pump, the pipe, and the filter. The pump refers to the heart, the pipe refers to the blood vessel, and the filter refers to the kidney. This drug, I'm not going into the details, benefits the kidney and it benefits the pipe, that is the blood vessel, and it helps the heart to pump the blood much more efficiently. Now, on the pump, there are studies which have shown that it can have a very early effect on the heart and it can sort of prevent hospitalization due to heart failure. You can see that compared to a placebo or inert drug, this drug called the SGLT2 inhibitor or otherwise called empaglyphlosin or dapaglyphlosin, canaglyphlosin, you can see a 
much difference, statistically significant difference between the inert drug, the placebo and the empagliflozin. This is the curve which produces heart failure. And you can see that even from the day one, you can see the benefit of giving the drug. So anybody who has heart failure should be receiving this drug or the SGLT2 inhibitor. So this is the action on the pump. And we also have the effect on the kidneys and on the pipe as well. Now, my good friend Sundar Mudaliar from the United States, he was the one who first gave the mechanism in which, by which it improves the pump. He said that it reduces fat oxidation. It increases the ketone body oxidation, beta hydroxybutyric acid oxidation. So this is called the fuel hypothesis, which is given by Sundar uh, from the United States. So the fuel hypothesis is the mechanism by which this drug improves the heart failure. Now, so therefore we have this drug called the SGLT2 inhibitor, which is empagliflozin, canagliflozin, dapagliflozin. We have a wonderful drug, okay? So what the American Diabetic Association, Diabetes Association has said, if you have predominantly a disease of the pipe, that is, if you have atherosclerosis, then you can use a particular hormone called a GLP-1 receptor agonist, GLP-1-RA, or you can use this drug which about which I talked to you just now, SGLT2 inhibitor. Whereas if your heart failure or kidney disease is predominant, you, the preference is given to the SGLT2 inhibitor. And the second preference is given to GLP-1 receptor agonist <clears throat> about the peptide I'm, I'm going to talk to you in the last five to six minutes. So if you have pipe disease, if the pipe is mostly involved, you can use the GLP-1, the peptide about which I'm going to talk to you, or the SGLT2 inhibitor. Whereas if your condition demands or the condition has predominantly heart failure or kidney disease, you first give the preference to SGLT2 inhibitor and then try the GLP-1 receptor agonist, the peptide which, about which I'm going to talk to you. The problem with this SGLT2 inhibitor, it acts through the kidney and it makes the sugar go in the urine. So if you don't take plenty of water, or even if some people take plenty of water, they get genital infection or urine infection. So when that happens, the patients feel it's a very nasty complication and you have to stop the drug. So that's when the peptide probably will step in. So SGLT2 inhibitors is a wonderful drug. Seven out of 10, eight out of 10 people tolerate it well, but one out of 10 or two out of 10 do not tolerate it and develop symptoms of the genital tract infection or urine tract infection. There was another organization apart from the ADA, which is called the American Association of Clinical Endocrinologists, ACE. They also said that you can use the GLP-1 receptor agonist or the SGLT2 inhibitor if your diabetes is not under control. So the GLP-1 receptor agonist, receptor agonist about which I'm gonna to talk to you is, has been recommended by the Indian Association, which is called RSSDI, ADA, AACE, and so on. So in the last five minutes or six minutes, I'm gonna to talk to you on this new drug which is called the GLP-1 peptide or the GLP-1 receptor agonist. When you get a new drug in the market, what we are concerned is the tablet should work on diabetes and control the diabetes. It should have good control. It should give you good control of diabetes. It should not produce weight gain. In fact, it should uh, help the person to lose weight if he's overweight off target effects, you know, you try to control diabetes and you end up having some other nasty symptom like genital infection, and there should be low risk of low blood sugar. 
Therefore, this is what the GLP-1 hormone does. And the peptide I'm going to talk to you about is based on this hormone, GLP-1, which is secreted by the intestinal cells. We know insulin is secreted from the pancreas or the beta cells. Whereas this hormone, GLP-1, is secreted by the intestinal cells, L cells. Now this drug, this hormone, GLP-1, addresses six out of eight mechanisms which are responsible for diabetes. This is the most important point. We have some eight mechanisms for diabetes, type 2 diabetes. The action of the liver, heart, brain, pancreas, gento, I'm sorry, gen, the GI tract, the kidneys and the muscles. So it has got effect on all these organs which you can see in this slide. Now this GLP-1 receptor agonist was still now available as an injection. And we know that doctors, patients, human beings in general, don't like to inject insulin. And that's been a big barrier to the usage of this GLP-1 hormone. Earlier, we used to use the vials and syringes. And today the GLP-1, which is available as liraglutide or Victoza, was available as a pen. But even then, you had to inject it. So there was a needle here and you had to inject it. And people preferred a tablet. And that's exactly what has happened today. You have this GLP-1 receptor agonist, which has come as a tablet. That's already come in Europe and United States and it's just come to India. Now, this is the first ever tablet form of GLP-1 receptor agonist, GLP-1 hormone. The advantages of this peptide hormone, peptide hormone, peptide pill is what I'm going to talk to you. Usually, if you talk about peptides, they get digested in the stomach. They don't cross the stomach. Insulin is a peptide. It will not, it will be digested. Why it's getting digested is because of the enzyme, proteolytic enzymes which are there in the stomach, which will digest the peptides like insulin. GLP-1 also was a peptide and it will get destroyed. There is limited permeability across the gastrointestinal epithelium. And there is very low oral bioavailability. So if you give it insulin, or a peptide like GLP-1 through the mouth, very little is available for the patient. So this was the main drawback and GLP-1 was available only as an injection till last week in India. And then came semaglutide, which is an oral peptide pill, which has got 94% homology. I mean, it, homology means it's similar to human GLP-1 hormone. How is it different from liraglutide, the injectable form? In the position eight of the GLP-1, it has been sort of replaced by another amino acid. So that is the difference. And it's long acting. Once you take the tablet, it works for nearly one week. You have to take the tablet every day, but it's got a half life of nearly one week. So even if you miss one day's tablet, doesn't matter, you can take it the next day. So semaglutide was a discovery from Denmark, Copenhagen, which lead, led to the path baking innovation in bringing this hormone as a pill. Now, semaglutide is a GLP-1 receptor analog, as I told you. Now, how did how did the changes happen and it come as a tablet? The GLP-1 receptor agonist was attached to something called a snack, which is nothing but you can see here, sodium N8, 2-hydroxybenzoyl amino caprylate. Don't ask me to remember the name. This is the name. So snack, it was attached to snack and it was attached to snack 
and therefore it was possible to take it as a tablet. Now the absorption from the stomach, once you attach this semaglutide to the snack, which you can see here, snack, this is the formula of snack. It occurs from the area where the tablet is present. When you swallow a tablet, the absorption happens from very close to the, where the tablet is. It, absorption doesn't happen all over the place in the stomach. It happens from the place where the tablet is located in the stomach. So when you take, swallow a tablet, the tablet gets absorbed by the, with the help of the snack from the area where it goes and lands in the stomach. Now, do we have data to show that oral semaglutide is effective? Yeah, we have phase 3A trials, phase 2 trials, and 24 clinical pharmacology trials. And we had about 9,500 people in what is called pioneer study. The pioneer study stood for uh, the peptide in early diabetes, early treatment of diabetes. Peptide innovation, I'm sorry. Peptide innovation in early diabetes treatment. This is what pioneers stand for. Peptide innovation in, L in early diabetes treatment. And there were so many pioneer studies, pioneer one, two, three, four, eight, and so on. And there were two Japanese studies as well. Now, what did these pioneer studies do? They were all in phase 3A. And in the next couple of minutes, I'm going to show you this pioneer study. They compared SGLT2 inhibitor. They compared the earlier drugs, which were their citagliptin and so on. It compared liraglutide and it was added on to insulin. So some people were already on insulin. It was added on in Pioneer 8. It was done in people with kidney disease. And there is a study which is going on, seeing whether it affects, it, it improves the heart condition. It's called the SOUL study, where a lot of Indians, 788 Indians are also there. Now, across the board, you can see that the HbA1c, which is a test to see the three months average, it improved compared in Pioneer 1 to placebo or the inert drug, compared to SGLT2 inhibitor, compared to citagliptin, compared to the injectable drug GLP-1, and in people with kidney disease and so on. You can see that this new drug, semaglutide, is better, is much better than its counterpart, the existing drugs. The existing drugs are glyphosins, empaglyphosin, dapaglyphosin, citagliptin, injectable, liraglutide. You can see that there is three dosing, three milligrams, seven and 14. As the doses increase, the effect on the HbA1c is remarkable. Now, if you compare the 14 milligram dose, compared to the existing drugs like EMPA, citagliptin, or liraglutide, you can see that the 2% reduction, if you have somebody with a baseline HbA1c of 9%, 9% is a rather bad, poorly controlled diabetes. But even if you have 9%, you can get a 2% reduction by using oral semaglutide. So, so oral semaglutide is a really effective drug even insulin produces a reduction of about 2% HbA1c. And you can see semaglutide 14 milligrams in people with HbA1c of 9 produces a drop of nearly 2%. It was about 2.6 in some studies. Now, we talked about body weight. If possible, you should allow people to lose weight, especially those who are overweight. So you can see that compared to even EMPA glyphosin, the weight reduction was better for oral semaglutide, 14 milligrams, of course. And with citagliptin also, you get a much better weight reduction. And even with liraglutide, you can see the weight reduction is much better for the injectable form. So the tablet is working better than the injection. This is what is currently available. And this is what is going to be available, the peptide in a pill. So you can get a weight reduction of up to 5 kgs. 
Now, is it safe for people with heart disease? Now, there are, as I told you, the soul study is looking at whether it is beneficial for the heart. But right now, we have data that it doesn't harm the heart. So, it may not be effective like SGLT2 inhibitors on the heart and kidney and so on. The data is just coming. The data on the kidney uh, is called the flow study, where it's looking at benefits on the kidney. The soul study is the focus, the flow study is on the kidney. The soul study is on the heart. These are probably one year later we'll have data. But right now we have data to show that the, as far as the heart is concerned by using what is called a three, three, three point maze system, you can see from this study, Pioneer 6, that oral semaglutide is not harmful for the heart. Whether it is beneficial for the heart, we will know uh, in due course, next year perhaps. Now, how do you take the drug? You have to take the drug because it's working through the stomach. Uh, you have to take it as soon as you wake up in the morning with 120 ml. They've shown that if you take more than 120 ml, the tablet will get dispersed and the erosion of the tablet is much more. So you can't take much water. You can take about 120 ml, which is better than 50 ml. In studies, it was shown that 120 ml is the best amount of water which you can take. So take up, when you get up in the morning, take your semaglutide. Don't take anything which is hot for the next 30 minutes. For the next, so when you get up in the morning, take the tablet and wait for 30 minutes before you have your favorite masala tea or coffee. You start with three milligrams and then you increase the dose to seven milligrams after one month. And in some people, you might need even 14 milligrams because I showed you some data that 14 milligrams is most beneficial. Now, if they miss a dose, there's nothing to worry. They miss the dose and take the next dose the next day. They should not take the drug after food and so on. It won't work. This is my last slide. So in India, we use, or most of the countries abroad, they use metformin as a first drug. So this could be a good add-on. If metformin is not enough, you can add this drug onto metformin especially if you want weight reduction to happen, especially if you want to avoid low sugar, and this is particularly in elderly people, you should try to avoid low sugar, hypoglycemia. If you're already injecting liraglutide, you can, and not reaching targets, you can change over to tablet or the patient doesn't like the injectable GLP-1 receptor agonist, you can switch over to the tablet. If you have high cardiovascular risk, you can use it, especially if you have a problem of the pipe. But if you have a problem of the pump or the kidney or the filter, then the SGLT2, as of now, is the better bet to add on to metformin. No dose adjustments are required in people who have some liver disease, or kidney disease. You can use it in older patients, there's no problem. The patient age does not appear to affect the efficacy or safety, so it can be safely given. But as older people, if you give them the other drug, the SGLT2 inhibitor, they have prostate enlargement and they might get urine infection, so that's the problem. So the summary of my talk, the oral semaglutide, the peptide in a pill, is the most effective medication for type 2 diabetes, which has been shown to reduce HbA1c, body weight, and also the pill burden. You can, read, you can stop many other drugs, so you can reduce the pill burden. You get this drug in for the first time in the world in a tablet form. It's a peptide for the first time in the world, which has, available, which has come available as a tablet because thanks to the association or the the combination with snack. 
you can get good weight reduction you can get good reduction of your diabetes control up to 2% i said and uh, even if you have your high hbunc you can reduce it by 2% 2.6% it's got in pine 6 the cardiovascular safety has been proven so it can be taken safely by people who have established heart disease and you have to start early because as i showed you the octet the six mechanisms which improve there is no point in giving it late you can add it on to insulin as i showed you in one of the pioneer studies but better you give it early as an add on to metformin i think that brings to my uh, end of my talk and just trying to stop sharing and if there are any questions i'd be happy to answer if i know the answer i'm not an expert we took our hospital took part in an oral semaglutide study for weight loss it's called the step 2 study but we have yet to try this out for diabetes so it is going to be tried uh, there are some questions already do you recommend peptide pill for type 2 diabetic patients having good glycemic control so it all depends so suresh kumar is asking so uh, if you have a good control and if you are well controlled don't have to change it you don't have to change it but supposing the patient is not tolerating one or two drugs and if you the patient finds he or she is putting on weight not losing weight you can definitely uh, try a semaglutide so it is not for somebody who's well controlled with existing drugs and going well so why should you simply uh, till the boat you know rock the boat as they say so sanjay is asking since drug has to be taken empty stomach as it got thyroidia so actually there was one study to sanjay which showed that the auc area under the curve of levothyroxine improves by 33% if you use oral semaglutide anyway that's not the point the point is uh, you can take oral semaglutide wait for 30 minutes and then take the thyroid tablet no problem but there was one study which showed that oral semaglutide increases the auc area under the curve of levothyroxine so i don't think it's harmful you can definitely take it what is the mechanism happening for weight reduction so I, as i told you the glp1 hormone has got multiple benefits on the pancreas and the brain so you eat less it produces satiety when you take the drug you don't feel hungry and you will not eat you will not snack that's one of the main mechanisms by which the peptide pill make makes you lose weight so weight reduction so you might get some feeling of satiety you won't feel hungry you won't feel like eating so that's one uh one of the mechanism is it a replacement for insulin yeah so nothing is a nothing is a replacement for insulin if you have to give insulin you have to give insulin there is insulin last year was your 100th year of insulin so if nothing works insulin will work if no tablet works insulin will work so it's not a replacement for insulin but it's a way of postponing insulin introduction of insulin so if you have somebody who is not responding to tablets you add this new tablet and you can actually delay the initiation of insulin maybe it will help you in that respect it is not a replacement for insulin and uh, having finished the um uh, thyroid medicine dose of reduction as it increases the area of exposure of thyroid so so far no you have to give your thyroid tablet along with semaglutide potassium and you have to measure the tsh after a month and see what happens so in clinical practice they have found that the the oral thyroxin dose need not be altered that's what data shows in some studies what are the side effects is it similar yeah you will have as you increase so this is what i use lot of these injectable uh, glp1 receptor agonists i use 
zero point six milligram in the injection. So far, what I've been using, and I go up to one point two. I don't go up to one point eight. So three milligrams, I don't expect much of side effect, which is nausea. I don't expect much with seven milligram because I am using one point two milligrams. But definitely with fourteen milligram, which is probably equivalent to one point eight milligrams in the injection, you might get nausea. You might not be able to tolerate it. That was a question from Dr. J. Chitra. Dr. Sriram also people on bisphosphonates, which one to be taken first? I have no clue, Sriram. If you know the answer, you can type it. Bisphosphonates. What, as far as I know, the first drug to take in the morning is semaglutide. Bisphosphonates are available as a spray, nasal spray, so you need not take it as a tablet. So you have uh, bisphosphonates, which is given uh, in an oral form also. And so it's a nasal spray also. So you can probably use it. But otherwise, it's semaglutide first, to the best of my knowledge. Insulin dose can be reduced when I take this pill. Yes. So uh, this, one of the pioneer studies, Pioneer 8, showed that if you add this drug to insulin, you can actually reduce the insulin dosages. I added Victoza, that is liraglutide, the injectable form to people who are taking massive doses of insulin. They were taking insulin four times a day and still not getting control. I added uh, liraglutide and I found the dose coming down. So definitely the dose should come down, but how much of it will come down is something which you have to see in your uh, practice. We'll take another two questions and then we'll stop because we have finished 45 minutes. I'm not able Yeah, so for non-diabetics, only for obesity can be used. Yeah, so it's a off-label. The government of India is not permitted so far oral semaglutide to be used for non-diabetic weight loss. The United States has approved it. It's available in the United States for weight loss, both the injectable and the tablet. But in India, the government of India is not yet permitted but off-label, you can use it for weight loss also. So there is a question by Vasudevan. Mitali is looking forward to its availability. Affordable cost, Satyavani, uh, it's an imported drug and it's coming straight from Denmark. So anything which is new will be costly. So it is expensive. It is expensive, but if you can afford it, well and good, you can use it. My father is using metformin and pioglitazone. Yeah, so it, as I told you before, if, he, if somebody is doing well with metformin and pioglitazone, and don't rock the boat if he's going well, but you know pioglitazone given for a long time can result in some cases of prostate, uh, bladder cancer and so on. So. Uh, especially if you use 30 milligram and so on. So if you would, if you feel that your father is taking pioglitazone for a long time or by taking metformin for a long time, if he's got gastritis, you can definitely think of adding a small dose of uh, this new drug. Mitali is asking in Indian patients, which three, seven, so uh, should we start and yeah, you have to start with three milligram and then go on to seven milligram. You cannot start with seven. So liraglutide, the injectable form, we were starting with 0 0.6. We see that 0 0.6 works in many people. So we don't increase, escalate the dose. But if you want to escalate the dose for weight loss or for diabetes, you can go up to 1.2. A couple of my patients from Bangalore who had used to take 1.8 also, they were very fat. And they did not have any problem. So 14 milligrams might be tolerated by some people. It all depends on the tolerability of the patient. 
my mother is 82 years old your old patient her sugar levels always high after breakfast 200 before dinner 200 insulin before breakfast 30 having persistent cough today if you cough you should check for covid 19 <laughs> so i think uh, you can it's better you consult your physician uh, because if you're having cough and all that it can't be used in type 1 because it's a hormone which is not insulin it's a it's another hormone which is produced by the intestinal l cells and in type 2 diabetes there is a deficiency of this hormone glp1 in type 2 in type 1 it is insulin it's insulin 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 so it can't be used in type 1 uh, sarveshwar is the absorption gastric ph dependent because we are asking yeah it is very much ph dependent you normally have a low ph and oral semaglutide will increase the ph and that's how one of the mechanisms, the attachment to snack is one. The second mechanism, the bioavailability increases, is by increasing the pH of the stomach. Therefore, uh, one of the mechanisms by which the oral semaglutide is absorbed, Dr. Sarveshwar, is by uh, increasing the pH. You are absolutely right. Effect of gastroparesis on absorption. So it's better you avoid it in people who have gastroparesis. Because people of gastroparesis have, like the in cricket, they show slow motion. They show how the bowler is bowling and the batsman is batting and all that. So the intestines also move very slowly in gastroparesis. And such is the case, if you give semaglutide, you're going to produce more problems, bloating and whatever. So it's better you avoid it in people who have a nasty intestinal movement already, who are constipated. You better avoid it. Cost analysis of the drug with insulin. See, insulin is definitely more cost effective. You have insulins which are much cheaper now, made in India. So insulin is definitely cost effective. So if you don't mind poking with insulin, poke yourself with insulin. It's, this drug is going to be more costly than insulin. Effective wise, it might be effective for type 2 diabetes, where insulin is not necessary in many cases. They just have to lose weight and the insulin will start working. So it's definitely more costly than insulin, but it all depends on whether insulin or tablet we want. Number two, whether you can afford it or not. Cost analysis of this drug with insulin. So I think that brings us to the question end. And we'll go to the chat box and take any last question. Insulin is also a peptide one why it can be used in type one. Yeah. So that's a question to the company which made this drug. I would ask the same question. If you can make oral semaglutide as an oral pill, why not you try this drug as a insulin as a peptide and try to get it beyond the stomach? That's a question which I've asked the company which made the drug. But there must be some intricate mechanism which only the scientists from Copenhagen can answer. But having said that, the spray insulin is available. It's going to be available in India very soon. It's available in the United States called Afriza. And one Indian company, which is a pioneer in making sprays for asthma, has taken up. We are involved in the trial. And they are going to introduce insulin as an inhaled spray. You get different doses with different colors spray. They've developed a prototype. The studies are going on. Once the DCJ approves, it will be in the market. So don't worry, the day is not very far off when you have inhaled insulin. But as a tablet, I don't know. I'm not the right person to answer your question. So I think that brings us to the question uh, end of the question answer session and the chat box questions. And uh, the Sri Ram, one last question is, will the cost be more than that of injectable uh, GLP-1? No, it, I think I calculated it will be almost same. It's almost same. Uh, if you're using 0 0.6, uh, it might be same cost. If you're using 1.2, also it might be same cost. So the cost between the injectable and the tablet is going to be almost same. So thank you very much for your 
uh, hearing and thank you for taking part and we will see you some other time if you have any other questions please feel free to post it in our facebook page and we will definitely get you the answers thank you very much